Welcome to the InnovaCorp Investment Readiness Series presented by Startup Yard at Cove. My name is Shelley Hessian. I'm the manager of Startup Yard, which is an InnovaCorp incubator focused on ocean technology startups. So welcome to um, our session three of our four-part series. Um, the session today is entitled Art of the Pitch. Our speaker is Andrew Bay, um, Vice President Investment at InnovaCorp. But before I do introductions and housekeeping, I'll invite Jennifer Petullo of InnovaCorp to talk about the next session after this. Thanks, Shelley. Um, yeah, I'm Jennifer Petullo. I'm an analyst on the investment team at InnovaCorp. It is fantastic seeing everyone here today and to, for the third week in a row, have so many exciting ocean tech startups in attendance. Um, as Shelley said, this is the third of four sessions in our investment readiness series. Our final session will be held next week, same day, same time. So Wednesday, December 15th at 1 p.m. Atlantic Standard Time. It is entitled Closing the Deal and will be taught by John Sari, Investment Director at InnovaCorp. Many of you are already signed up to attend this session, but if anyone is not yet signed up and would like to attend, uh, please just shoot me a quick email, uh, which you can find in the reminder sent out for today or in the, uh, the final slide of the presentation. Uh, that's it for me for now. Again, welcome. I'll pass back to you, Shelley. Thanks, Jennifer. And a big thank you, Jennifer, for organizing this series and doing all the planning. Um, a few housekeeping notes, um, please um, keep on mute when you're not speaking. We're recording the session um, and Andrew will take questions throughout the whole session. Um, so I'm sure he'll, uh, he'll open it up to questions at any time. So welcome everybody and let me introduce Andrew. So Andrew Ray is the Vice President of Investment at InnovaCorp where he oversees the organization's venture capital activities. He, as part of the senior management team, Andrew leads the Novacorp's work to find, fund, and foster innovative Nova Scotia startups that strive to change the world. So Andrew works hands-on with the Novacorp portfolio companies. Uh, he's a board member of several companies. He's got startup experience. Um, he's got a Bachelor of Science in Astrophysics and a Master's of Science in Space Studies and an MBA. Um, so welcome, Andrew. Um, we're very excited to have you here today, and the floor is yours. Thanks, Shelley. Um, thanks for that introduction. I'll add in a, a few other pieces in here. As Shelley mentioned, uh, I did have some startup experience. I do have some peripheral ocean experience, but primarily in the tech sector. Um, in the space sector, I worked on a satellite used for primarily for ocean monitoring. Um, I've worked with a few companies in the ocean sector over the few years at InnovaCorp. Uh, today's presentation, um, one, the bulk of it is not from InnovaCorp. Um, I borrowed this material from, I borrowed, uh, stole this material from Guy Kawasaki, Art of the Start. Uh, this is the art of the pitch. This is his, basically the content of today's uh, workshop is his 10 slides that he recommends that uh, startups use when they pitch investors. Uh, I've seen a lot of pitch decks over the years. I've seen a lot of pitch deck templates. And this is for me the best one that I've come across. And this is the one that I share with companies when I'm preparing them to come in and pitch a Novacorp for investment. So the this Pitch Deck answers basically all of the questions we want to see when somebody comes in to pitch a Novacorp for investment uh, and cuts out all the stuff that can basically wait till later. Uh, 10 slides is not very many. Uh, it's much harder to do 10 slides than it is to do 40 or 50 slides presenting your business. The real key is understanding which slides you want to keep in. And obviously this can de depend on your audience. It will differ for each group, but generally investors are looking for certain things. Uh, investors are not engineers, they're not customers. So you don't need to go into depth describing your technology, your product, and you're not trying to sell them on buying your product. Um, my background is in engineering. My first view as an entrepreneur was, look at all this great stuff I've created. Here's 80% of my pitch was all the great stuff I built and then 20% was all this other stuff. Whereas in actuality, what investors are interested in is the business opportunity, 
And then one piece of that is the technology you built. Now, if all of that comes together, then for sure they're going to dig into the technology and what you're actually doing. But first, you have to tell them the story that gets them interested in your business opportunity, not in your technology or product. So this deck is what I usually do with this pitch deck. When I'm working with a company, I will sit down with them individually and we'll go through this pitch deck and basically answer all the questions that come up out of it uh, so that when they come in to work with pitch to a Nova Corp, they're ready to pitch. Um, so this session is basically designed on that process. Instead of using one company, instead of working with one company, I'm working with 40 people. So there's a few differences in 40 people. Uh, we probably aren't gonna get to hear from everybody, uh, but what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna walk through the pitch deck with you, talk about what we wanna see in each slide. I'll give you an example from our portfolio of what that, that slide might look like. And then I'll probably get one example from the group. So if you've done some homework, I think Jen might've sent out some homework ahead of time. If you've got the, your, your version of these slides prepared, um, I welcome you to share them. I'll ask for probably an individual for each slide to share. And then we'll walk through, we'll discuss how to change that slide or why that works or why that doesn't work. Uh, so given that, I'll get started. Uh, I'm just gonna move my screen so I can see most of the deck rather than most of you. Um, and we'll jump right in. Um, so as, as I mentioned, first off, this is the only 10 slides you need in a pitch. Uh, really more is less. <laughs> um, less is more, I guess is the way to say that. Uh, the more slides you need, the less compelling your idea. So not only is it better to have fewer slides, but if you have more slides, we're going to think less of the company. It's going to be harder for us to understand. It's going to imply that you're not focused is basically what it implies. So if you can whittle your deck down into just the core, your business into just the core pieces, uh, that's going to be very compelling. Your, interest, your objective here is not to give us all the information about your company but just the information we're looking for so that basically everybody's time is optimized. So if I say 10 slides is difficult, even more difficult is the first slide. So think of this as if you had a one sentence pitch, what is this? And this shouldn't be a long rambling sentence. Once again, here, less is more. Uh, so for instance, I'll give you an example of one of our companies. This is not their pitch deck, but what I would say if I were them, in this, and this is, I'll use an ocean example here because we're talking about ocean companies. Uh, hi, I'm, and I won't share their name, but we're GIT and we provide coatings that make ships more fuel efficient. So that's a, this is basically off the cuff. Um, my usual example is one of my portfolio companies, but here is an ocean one. I think they're a great example. So GIT, you know who the company is and what they do, they basically provide graphene based paint that you paint on ships and it makes them faster or more fuel efficient, reducing drag. And so just one sentence, what you're trying to do here is you're trying to catch the interest of the investor. Um, I don't know how many pitches I sat through waiting, waiting, waiting to understand what the company does. It's like, and if you don't get me right at the beginning, uh, the longer it takes to, for me to understand what you do, the less chance I have of being interested in it. Uh, so that's one of our companies. I'm going to ask for a volunteer from the audience to give me the one sentence version of your company. Maybe use the raise hand feature. Um, I think of this as an oh, Douglas Morum from Queen Valley. Um, I expect he can unmute himself. You're Hi there. So, so hello. tell us who you are and what you do, Doug. Douglas. All right, I, uh, I work for Clean Valley and I'm the product development specialist. And um, can I just do my sentence? Yep. Okay. Hi there, I'm Douglas from Clean Valley and we make aquaculture wastewater profitable. Um, now, so that, that's actually, that's a good one. Um, the things that I'm interested in, so, one, I generally know what you're doing, so this is pretty good. Uh, first off, obviously the, the name, but uh, aquaculture, uh, wastewater profitable. <laughs> I'm wondering how that works, what that does, what does that really mean? Um, so some good things in there. Um, 
Yeah, what I say, we, I might say something like we clean wastewater, make, or we, what do you do with wastewater that makes it profitable, I guess is my question, Doug. Mm -hmm. Well, isn't that part of the first slide to drum up interest? Um, yes, and I obviously, yeah, so go on, go on and tell me, uh, what do you do to make wastewater profitable? Yeah. So what we do is we filter uh, the wastewater from aquaculture land-based operations using algae, which creates a secondary product, which can be sold. Um, so this that wastewater, which is usually a, um, a hindrance for the company to deal with using traditional bacterial biofilters. Uh, so yeah, this, uh, uh, this is good. And there are, um, th this is an area of interest. Um, I, I like that. Yeah, this falls into the broader category of, for me, of, let's say waste to value or something that people don't want turning it into something of value. So generally good things there. Um, I, I might say something like we create or we create uh, whatever it is that you create from wastewater rather than turning wastewater profitable, but something along those lines, that, that's pretty good. Um, don't know the specifics without knowing the details of your company, but we, or we turn wastewater into a new revenue stream for aquaculture providers or aquaculture, what do you call somebody who's an aqua, aquaculturist? Uh, aquaculture <laughs> farms. Um, yeah, I might go with that one. We turn, yeah, so what you wanna do for the whole, the whole pitch deck that we're working through here today together, um, the number one focus in your mind, this should be one story and it starts with who is the customer? So for instance, with your, with your one, Doug, um, who, is, who is making the profit? Is it the aquaculture farmer getting a new revenue stream? Are you taking their wastewater and then like creating a product of value that then you sell? Like who gets the, who gets the profit, I guess? Mm. So um, depending on uh, how it's designed, it could even be like a partnership or um, kind of like a, a royalty percentage of like the product that is created from the wastewater stream that goes back to the aquaculture farmer. Um, and so my sense. view, and I mean, this is going to, we're going to come into the next question. And I'm going to go to the next slide and then talk a bit about this and we'll move on and I'll give another example on the next slide. Um, so the next slide is basically the problem that you're solving. And here again is whose problem are you solving? And so if you think of your customer, Doug, and that customer is an aquaculture firm, uh, if you can make them more money or save them money, uh, they will give you money. Like that, that's the basic premise. And so in your case, Think who is going to save money, who's going to make money off of this, who's going to buy this. If your customer is, it's likely the farm and they're likely going to make more money. Right now they have to spend money to handle their wastewater. Now their wastewater will be a new revenue stream for them. So where, where before, let's say they had to spend like $1,000 a month to process, to manage this. Now they're making $1,000 a month. Um, and who in the room, you don't need to show hands, if somebody were to give you basically $2,000, would you give them money in return? Um, and here the answer is almost always gonna be yes. If you can save me a thousand bucks, will I give you a hundred dollars for sure? $200 probably, $900 maybe, but I gotta be pretty confident they're gonna save me money. And so when you're thinking of that first slide, you always have to think of who are you saving money? Who are you servicing? So now it's, um, we create a new revenue stream for we're Clean Valley and we turn, yeah, we turn wastewater into profit for aquaculture farmers. So maybe the only addition I would add is kind of the for aquaculture farmers instead of aquaculture in general. So now it's a bit clear who the customer is. Okay, so slide. Now this is where we get into the meat of the presentation. So number two, so here you want to really describe the pain you're alleviating for your customer or the pleasure you're providing. So for instance, for GIT, one of our portfolio companies, uh, the pain that they're solving is that you think of ships, 
as they sit in the ocean, stuff grows on them and makes them slower. So they have a graphene-based coating that prevents stuff from growing on it, makes ships slipperier, more slippery, and, and helps them go faster or save fuel. Uh, so in sort of recent uh, test results, they save about 20% of fuel costs. So you think a big container ship going across the ocean, spending hundreds of thousands of dollars a day generally in fuel, that translates directly into money in their pocket for their customers who are the people who run these ships. Basically anybody who operates a ship can save fuel by painting it with their special paint. Um, so now I'm gonna ask for, so I'm gonna ask for another volunteer and I see, is it Maja or Ma Maya? Maya. Uh, You've got your hand up from the other one. Um, and I see, I guess you jumped the queue a bit on that from the last. Are you ready to tell us what pain your company solves for your customers? Sure. sure. Um, I was actually wanted to, to ask a question, but that but maybe a good way to, uh, to ask that question is to is to say our our problem, the problem we're solving. So um, we're solving the problem of uh, producing. Uh, so our clients are uh, marine uh, vessels, and they have um, a problem with uh, with vibrations uh, reducing, um, um, causing costs of for maintenance, and um, they're um, spending fuel on things like fueling electronics. We can solve both of those problems. But for my question here is how should we frame this? Because our product is, is a generator that harvests energy from motion. We're using it to solve both these two problems because it can also harvest vibrations and it can, um, it can power electronics so it reduces fuel consumption. So this, but, is a good, this is a good overall question before I get to the answer and digging in. Um, solving two problems is not necessarily better than solving one problem. Exactly. Uh, it, so that's my question. Like, how how should we frame that, really? <laughs> it, so uh, I'll say it's actually it's worse than solving one problem because if so, imagine your pitch deck and you're telling two stories. So now you've got this problem and this problem, and you've got this solution and this solution, and the value proposition is different for each. Um, and it's which business are you building? Which problem do I have to believe in? What's actually going on in here? So it's rare that two problems are equal. So which problem, and the number one way to answer this question is not for me to tell you which one I think is the better answer, but to go talk to ship owners, which of these two is a bigger problem, which if the ship owners don't recognize it as a problem, um, then that's not the answer. So like, have you talked to ship owners? And if you have, which of these is a bigger issue for them? And that's the number one way to answer it. Um, yeah, so I guess that's kind of been my strategy that, so I've been in my pitch, like when I'm talking, talking to, to potential clients, I'm, I'm focusing on the fuel consumption and then um, I kind of dig into a conversation with them and they, um, like sometimes I will have, have uh, things like oh oh you dampen vibrations as well well that's amazing you know so i th i think it's a good advice that you're giving to to basically just talk to people about it and try and discover their which which problem is worse yeah and yeah and think of it as here's the main problem so let's say the fuel consumption is the main problem and then the vibrations is sort of icing on the cake mm. um and one of them, one of them is going to be bigger than the others. My my bet also would be that it's fuel consumption is top of their mind. I not that I've talked to a lot of them, but um, I haven't had someone ever say, "Oh, I would really like to reduce by vibrations on the ship." Yeah, they would like to, but is that a nice to have? Could they quantify how much? Uh, maybe they can, or maybe things are breaking because things are vibrating, and it's going to save them in maintenance. But those are, those are much harder to quantify those costs. Um, and it's much more likely that you're going to have to educate your customer around the pain that you're solving. If they don't view it as one of their top three pains, you probably shouldn't be solving it. Um, so once again, like this is the same value prop as GIT, but from a different technology. It's like 
you're basically wasting energy. Uh, ships are wasting energy by vibrating when you try when you try to put energy into the propeller. That energy goes elsewhere, and instead of the the propeller moving, basically the rest of the ship is moving, uh, wasting energy and like and wasting energy. And so we capture that energy back and and allow uh, allow that energy to be reused, saving yeah, ultimately saving fuel for ships. Um, like that, that, that's the path I would go uh, down that route. Uh, but here we're talking about the pain is that ships vibrate, uh, waste energy, we recapture that energy uh, and utilize it so ships become more fuel efficient. And yeah, yeah, don't do, yeah, yeah don't, don't go through, yeah, here's, you're gonna have all the other things that you do as well, and we'll dig into those in the details, but what's the like what's the killer app number one reason somebody's going to use your uh, product um, so this is the problem right next to the problem is the value proposition and we got into like we got into that a bit with uh, Maya and what's going to happen is ship owners are going to say they're going to reduce fuel costs uh, because now they don't have to power their electronics because we they, yeah, I'm just thinking of all the things that it's sort of like a turbo, it captures waste energy, wasted energy. Um, so now I'm going to do this for GIT. So, and we did this a bit before. So ship owners spend a lot of money on fuel and drag makes them spend more money. So for, so they provide a coating that when you paint your ship, it makes the ships uh, sleeker and faster and saves their customers money. Um, and so here, as Mar Mar said this very well, so this is the benefits delivered that provide value to the target customer. So once again, it's that same idea that you need to be thinking of the customer first. What is the value the customer gets out of it um, that you deliver to that customer? So Maya is gonna be delivering uh, energy to that customer that otherwise is wasted, that's gonna save them money. Um, somebody else in the room, I think I saw Mark, uh, raise his hand for the last one and didn't buzz in quick enough. Um, so Mark, tell us a bit about your product and the value that it provides to your customers. Maybe start with who are your customers uh, and what's the value you provide them? Sure, so we're an aircraft manufacturer. Our customers are people who use uh, small unmanned autonomous aircraft. Um, our aircraft are able to fly in weather that other aircraft in the same category can't. Our value proposition is for any uh, buddy who's invested in unmanned aircraft, regardless of purpose. We allow them to fly it at any time, not just when there's good weather. So we allow them to get almost twice the value out of the money they're already spending on their aircraft. So now here, I'm going to push for, and not necessarily right here in this conversation, but to be a bit more specific in terms uh, of the value provided. Are they, like, think of, think of your customer having, your customer doesn't want an aircraft. They, your customers have jobs that they do with that aircraft. And um, some of those jobs they can't do um, some of the time because they're in inclement weather. So like flying an aircraft twice as long isn't what they want. They want to get the value out of it at the end. Um, and so so what if, value. So for yep. instance, if it's a search and rescue helicopter or- uh, Yeah, I, I can give that example for, so search and rescue or delivery, let's say to the North Sea, about half the time existing aircraft cannot perform those missions because of the weather conditions. We can. And so now like, not like, see that's like, as soon as you've got a, not just a customer, but an application for that customer, it, per, it just sort of clarifies the whole value proposition. It clarifies the whole business. Um, the, the bit that you want, you're gonna to wanna to be careful with, and I don't know what this looks like going through the rest of the pitch, is uh, we started off saying one story, the further, you wanna follow that one story all the way through the pitch deck. So that opportunity needs to be big enough to be interesting. And we're gonna get into that uh, a bit later. Uh, but for instance, if search and rescue is a big enough opportunity, um, the compelling story is like in adverse weather conditions, 
it's not safe to put people in helicopters and fly them out on the ocean looking for people whose boats have capsized because the weather is bad. And so you have this really bad problem of you, you're basically, people are losing their lives potentially because we can't find them because it's dangerous to go, dangerous for us to go looking for them. So our helicopters allow like search and rescue teams to fly and find people when it's too dangerous for, for operators to go out there or too windy or too for normal uh, drones to fly out there. Right, that the only exception is it's not when it's too dangerous. Currently, they can't. So it, it's, not, it's not a danger function. It is a go, no-go function. So there's zero value to the aircraft that can't take off. And, they're, and they already invest in those because when they can take off, they're very valuable. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, when they can't take off, there's zero value. So if I'm going to go rescue people, uh, I would like to do that 24 seven whenever it's needed. Right now, much of the time, there is zero value to their existing investment. Um, all we do is we're the same investment they already made, except that it doesn't have that limitation of can't use it. So here, here once again, I would like think of this in comparison with their existing solution. Not like they're not, are they, they might have both uh, are, are you comparing with, do they already have drones that they can't use to go find people? Like, give me the, the use case. So the weather conditions don't allow them to fly or don't allow them to take off. And so they can't, so the, the downside isn't that they can't fly. They don't really want to fly. What they want to, what do they want to do by flying? Well, let's so just, a, we, we could use like, let's say they want to deliver a critical part. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but deliver a critical who's delivering a critical part to whom an oil rig um, in the north sea yeah so for instance there's a yeah an oil rig in, in the north sea is needs critical part um that can't be delivered in uh in adverse sort of weather conditions so we help deliver those parts and so what's the so that scenario the downside is when does that part get there um after the storm is over so maybe a day or two later maybe it's a critical part and so for critical yeah so like thinking thinking through who's actually using the part what's the value they're, they're getting out of it that part will get there it'll just get there two or three or four days later whenever that storm settles down and so we build drones that are about the same price as other drones are more expensive but it we can guarantee that the parts will get there within 10 day or within like half an hour, whatever the number is. Um, and so who is so who is buying that part? Is it the oil rig or is it a delivery service? Um, these are all interesting questions of who's actually who's getting the value out of this? Is it the delivery provider? Is it the um, is it the oil like, like just like that? Like those are the questions that we're going to ask. Who's going to get the value out of it? Um, and the short, uh, once again, the short answer is where do you create the most, where does this product create the most value? So if you look at all the potential customers that you have, like there's oil rigs, there's search and rescue, there's probably five other things. Looking through, through those opportunities, one of those is likely to be the most valuable over all the others. Um, if you have to piece five together, it's less compelling than if you have one that's like, that's very big and very sort of accessible or addressable. Um, so I'll just give that as sort of feedback and then move on to the to the next one. But just remember that it's the target, the value that you provide to the customer. Like how do they get value out of it? Um, so Thank now, uh, so now here is the for the engineers in the room or the people who make things in the room um, and that used to be me you got one slide um here where you tell us how the thing works uh, once again this isn't to go into all the whoops this isn't to uh, try, uh, this isn't to go into all the details uh and all the technical stuff that you're going to talk about we don't need to see the the proprietary technology here we just want that high level view of how it works or the secret sauce what makes this work when others won't um 
uh, as the quote says, like the picture is worth a thousand words, a prototype is worth 10,000 slides. Um, so showing us what you've got is, is great. It's like, here's what it is and here's how it works. And so for instance, with Mark's, uh, with Mark's uh, drone, he like shows a picture, bring it like if it's, if it, I don't know how big it is, but like if it's big enough, like if you can bring it in and people can see it, it's like, oh yeah, this thing is gonna work when others, uh, others won't or like here, like a little video of, how, of it working or a demo of it working. Like that's what you want to show us, but remember this is like one slide out of ten. Um, so for here, like for GIT, they've got graphene in their paint that makes it super slippery and that stuff doesn't stick to it. And when they would pitch us, like when I would talk to them, like they have samples and it's like you here's some metal with graphene painted this graphene paint and you feel it and it feels slippery. Um, or like some something like that that you can sort of show how your technology works. Uh, so I'm going to go to the next person up with the next person with their hands up who would like to tell us how their product works. And you can give us the quick summary of who's who's it for and what does it do before you tell us how it works. Yeah, we can't have exhausted all the volunteers already. Um, or maybe there's, oh, Sean. Uh, you're up, Sean. Hey, great. Uh, so we- so Tell us a bit who you are, or who you, what your company is, and what it does for who. Okay. Quantum Devices Core makes cameras that access the entire sun spectrum. And or, yeah, and for who does it do this? Uh, who would want to use that? Um, so silicon starts imaging at like low wavelengths of 350 nanometers and stops at one micron. And there's no solution today that accesses the entire sun spectrum. And that's important for range, seeing further, for light, seeing more and for things like greenhouse gas identification. Okay, so so you're tell so you're you're doing a good job of telling me how your technology works, uh, which is specifically what I asked, which is good. Um, so I have a bit of a background in remote sensing and understand the spectrum. And so there's stuff that we just can't see. Um, and if I'm thinking about this, um, yeah, so there's stuff that we can't see and what we can't see might hurt us. Uh, and so our product lets people see things that might otherwise hurt them in what way. Um, so now, like, how does it, like, so you, what do your sensors look like? What is, like, how do they work? What's different about them that lets you see the ends of the spectrum that normal cameras wouldn't be able to see? Okay, so we use quantum dots and they skipped the interconnect technology limitations of other materials that aren't silicon and they skip the physical transparency barriers of silicon itself. Um, so like you, that's probably the right level. Maybe you, with some diagrams, this would actually be, uh, this would be pretty good. Uh, you've got me interested in how the technology works. Um, and I'm wondering who uses this technology and what do they use it? What do they, what do they look for? What are they trying to see? So greenhouse gases. So not see, I know I can't see them physically. Maybe sometimes I can. Um, like, what do you see with your cameras? Um, so you pay for that. Yeah. So you can see greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide and methane. You can use it with lasers that are more powerful so that you can do 3D imagery at larger scale than just sort of facial identification. So is the, so from what I'm hearing from you, greenhouse gas detection, is that the core application for this? No, it's one of the applications, but it's the application that we're choosing to focus on specifically now because it's it's topical, it's at the 
it's at a good place for our technology. It combines a lot of things that we think make us a unique value proposition. So, and what I would say to that is yes, and then all the rest of the things you just sort of laid out. And like that, we're focusing on this because this is the one, because we want to save the world. And this is the, this is the path to help us do that. And we will make money at it because uh, people will, yeah, who, yeah, who's going to pay for it is, I guess, the next, who pays for this? Is it governments? Is it, um, yeah. So I've been bonked over the head with that one a lot. <laughs> um, <laughs> and you will continue to be until you have a, an answer that people I, like I do hear. have an answer. I think the people who will pay for this initially are the people who are transporting gases that have methane and carbon dioxide, like the energy sector initially, and will spread out from there. Um, so let's say it's a compliance, um, it's, it's a way to demonstrate compliance. Uh, yeah, it's a way to find if you've sprung a big leak, where, where yeah. is it without local sampling, because you're imaging as opposed to putting an electrochemical sensor out there and running down the pipeline. Yeah, um, there's a, we can go through the rest of the conversation about uh, the pitch deck, a couple of thoughts. Um, force it, people being forced to use your product is not generally a good good answer you want them to want to use your product yeah um, i i think that yeah. we want to get, like i i think people spring leaks all the time like if you're building like a, a greenhouse gas uh, or sorry a greenhouse uh ag agriculture environment you know if you've got a leak in, in your your box basically you'd like to know where it is and seal it up and i think lots of people even in like the uh the energy sector if they're transporting gases if they spring a leak easier to find for them if they can just see where it's coming up. Um, assuming that there's some financial repercussion to them doing it. So there's there's nice to haves and then there's financial reasons uh, for sort of supporting your for buying your product. If they're buying it to be good, um, some people will buy it to be good. If they're buying it because it saves them money, everyone will buy it uh, is the short. Uh, version, but just sort of think through that as you're thinking through the, the business model, your customer and who, how they'll use it. If you can, if you can either save people money or they can replace something they're currently doing at a similar price and you can do it significantly better, those are all compelling reasons. Uh, doing something that's good but costs more uh, is going to be a slow adopter and slow to sort of get traction and grow. That's sort of how we'll think about it as it's coming through. Um, but we'll move on to the next slide. How are we doing on time? Uh, let's see, right about, hey, four slides, 40 minutes, um, roughly on time. Uh, so now we get into the, to the, in, to the, whoops, to the things in my title moves. Uh, so here's, telling me how you're going to make money out of this. We were getting into this a bit with Sean, um, but this is important. So if I'm going to invest in this, I'm not investing in your product, I'm investing in your business. And if I'm investing in your business, it's because I think there's a path for you to make profit out of your business. Um, so you want to show your investors how big that opportunity is and how much money they could possibly make. Um, so here, I'll, once again, I'll use the example of GIT. So GIT basically sells paint. Uh, it sells paint to uh, uh, to shipping companies or people who operate boats. Uh, those people paint their boats and they pay for the paint and then they save money. For a large container ship, let's say it costs a container ship about a million dollars to paint their boat. And then ideally they would save maybe $5 million in fuel costs over the life of that uh, paint job. I don't know the savings off the top of my head. Uh, but in this case, this is a sort of what we would call a transactional model where they, they buy something once. Five years from now, they're probably going to buy it again. So it's not too bad. Um, other models, like I did a lot of software investments where if somebody pays a subscription for your service and they pay you every month, those are the optimal business models um, because they come with predictability and lower costs for acquiring customers. The, the real thing that you're looking for here is how are your customers getting value out of your product? If they're getting value once um, 
And then that's it. Like it's a one-off, you're not gonna be able to charge them month over month for a one-off value. If you're if they're using your product like all the time, like like think of the software product, if you use it every month and you're getting value out of, out of it every month, then there's a much easier sort of business model case for charging them every month out of it. Um, now, the other thing to consider is what does the industry tip, how does the industry typically pay for the similar products to yours? So for instance, GIT, their paint goes on boats, people are using it every month, but everybody buys paint and puts it on and then gradually it deteriorates. Um, it'd be probably a hard sell to convince a boat company to pay you on a monthly uh, based on how much fuel savings you get them. They could try that, but it's much more likely that they're gonna fit into the existing model just selling paint like everybody else and their paint is better. Um, somebody wanna tell me what their business model is, how they make money from their customers? Uh, waiting for a hand. Oops. I'd like to ask you a question. I can't seem to raise my hand. Uh, sure. <clears throat> Sorry. Andrew, so um, our business model is, I guess I'm a little unsure of it now based on what you've been talking about for the last couple of minutes. Um, so we, we're, we're considering a, a large emergency uh, towing system. Well, uh, it's, it's, it's a system for large ships. And it's the kind of thing that you only sell it once to a, to a ship owner. And hopefully, hopefully he or she never has to use it. So it would be installed and waiting around for, um, for an emergency. And I, I guess I'm a little unsure how we, uh, I mean, it seems obvious that, um, that it's sort of an insurance kind of thing. But uh, but maybe maybe there's another way to to present it. But that's about it. Well, really, we're just we're hoping that they never have to use it. They never get into a situation where their ship is abandoned and they have to use this thing. So and I uh, picked up a few things that you said. So this is for ships that get abandoned. It's is it something that needs to be on the ship or is it something that you can bring to the ship? No, it would been... be in. No, our, our, our model would be that it's uh, something that you sell to the ship owner, you install it on the ship, and uh, should, it, should the ship be abandoned at sea uh, 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 with the loss of power and uh, potentially going on the rocks, uh, it would be launched and, um, and be taken under tow. So launch, like our emergency towing system would be launched and uh, a ship standing by or a tug would uh, would take it under tow, thereby saving it from going on the rocks. So, um, so that would be the model. But there's no sort of there's no sort of hook to keep people interested in it for the long term. It's just going to be something that's uh, you know installed on the forward part of the ship, and uh, and hopefully they never have to use it. But how do you convince them that it's uh, that it's a pretty serious thing? Should uh, should they not have it and they get into that kind of a situation? So this is another, this is a good question because it illustrates a, a good point. Um, selling people insurance is, is tougher um, than selling them something that they use every day. Um, so for people to buy insurance, they have to have some idea of what it's gonna cost them if things go bad. Um, so, and then to be worried about that happening. So maybe if they've had a ship that's crap, if they lose a whole ship uh, because the ship, if the ship loses power and crashes, then they're gonna need something like this. So the way I would think about this in my mind is how likely is that to happen? Um, and what is the cost if it happens? So now, I, so between those two things, I can assess the value. So let's say one out of a hundred ships is going to at some point in their life need this um, and let's say it's halfway through their life so now the cost of it can't be if only one out of 100 needs it it can't be more than one 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 hundredth of the total cost of the ship um, and you want to give them a good value, like you want to give them a compelling reason to buy it so let's say they get 10 times the value out of it so let's say they save one percent the cost of a ship or a one in 100 chance of losing their ship and now you charge them 10% of that and so they get a 10x back on that then it, see, then it should be the no-brainer because 
hey, I'm going to lose one out of 100 ships using your product. Yeah, I'm not going to lose any ships, and it's going to only cost me one out of a thousand ships in terms of price. And so that at least gives you the price. And then what you, you want to you do know, is, Andrew, it's a, yep. yep, go on, Drew. Yeah, it might not be in the loss of a ship. I mean, the, the, the ever given caused great uh, distress to the when it blocked the Suez, and they were fully manned at the time. Uh, but um, if they had uh, our system on the stern and were able to fire it off immediately when the bow went aground, um, who's to say that they might have been able to keep the stern from getting wedged by the excessive tides over a period of days and made the recovery a lot easier? Uh, so it, it could be the ship in distress, it could be abandoned. Um, one, one of the longer term ideas that we offer life cycle management, uh, so if a 15 year cycle of the, of the system, we would be managing it with also a, uh, a subscription to a command and control center that would um, be able to on demand um, trigger this remotely operated autonomous system that you don't need anybody around to uh, to rig in the emergency. So um, that may well, be so an option as well. So here's we're getting to, we're getting into the problem we're getting into the problem that you solve. So is the like what is the problem that you solve if a ship runs out of power at sea and it needs to be towed or else it hits the rocks? Like that's one problem. Like here's another use case where let's say you're the Suez Canal or the Panama Canal and you don't want the canal to be shut down again ever. So any here's you're going to impose on all ships who come through it you have to have one of these systems on board or something like this on board so that this doesn't happen. And now if you don't have it on your ship, you can't operate um, because like, I mean, that's that's a different model and different sort of price because there's a different, the, there's a different pain that comes out of it. So what you wanna do is you wanna connect the pain to the price you're charging. Um, and you wanna basically save people like a 10X return on investment is the no brainer. 10% um, return on investment is this thing better be 100% guaranteed to work. And even then, it better be a big deal uh, or else it's just not worth my time. Um, Andrew, just before you went, um, uh, before we have Drew another got you off, kind of a... I just wanted to say, I, I wanted to ask though, like the, the sort of the math that you were talking about, and is that the kind of thing that you, um, you actually sort of rationalize, reduce? and put it into the business model slide? Or do you do it in words? So, and so I, I'm sort of giving you some, um, yeah, like you, I think you want, you want to put it in here. So you, even better than like the slide before is when we talk about the pain, um, let's look at the pain. It's if you can quantify the pain, it's all the better. So for instance, ships, you lose this much, ship operators lose this much money because their ships lose power. Uh, every year. So think of the slide. If you can quantify that, put a dollar value on it. If you save shipping companies a billion dollars a year, you will, in my mind, what I'm immediately thinking is if you can save people a billion dollars, you can charge them a hundred million. And so I'm doing that math in my mind to see if that all works out to a business that will go grow quickly. So you save them a billion dollars. Here's how much you charge them. And those numbers, you can't charge them more than you save them. There should be a good return for the investors. So, I mean, you don't have to show the, the return for them, but if you say I'm charging them $100 million as an industry and saving them a billion dollars, like I wanna see that. Because um, I also wanna see what we refer to in here is the total addressable market. Like, right. so okay. if, how much are you gonna save for shipping providers around the world? So what I'm doing here, is I'm assessing the size of the opportunity. And so when we're talking total addressable market, think how many ships are there in the world that could use your product? And if they all used it, how much money would that generate you on an annual basis? And so for me, that number needs to be a billion dollars for me to be interested in investing in your company. Not that you need to be able to sell a billion dollars worth of your product in any given year, but my expectation is if, you, if there's a billion dollar market, and you can sell 10% of that. If you can get to $100 million and you've got a billion dollar company, that's sort of the thinking that goes through my mind. Um, but these things allow me to size the opportunity. So they're super important uh, because if you're, oper let's say there's only 10 ships in the world and you charge each of them a million bucks, that might be a great business because you make $500,000 off of each ship. 
but there's no path to that being a large opportunity where it's gonna make sense for me to put a $5 million investment in your company if you're only ever gonna to get to $5 million in, in total sales. So, yeah, okay. so what, what I wanna see, what I wanna see here, uh, whenever a company comes in is basically, you've got a billion dollar market and that market is determined by how many customers, the ones that you talked about at the beginning, how many of those customers are there and how much are you going to charge them basically on an annual basis? Okay. And you can either sell them a subscription annually. You can sell product annually that lasts for five years. So like with GIT, let's say they recoat their boats every five years. So the total market is the total number of ships times the cost of paint for one ship um, divided by five years. And there's your, there's how much paint they can sell in any given year. And that number should be over a billion dollars for it to be a, for institutional investors. It doesn't mean that uh, there isn't a good business or that other investors won't be interested, but if you're looking for venture capital money or investor money, that billion dollar market is sort of the minimum and a billion dollar market has the potential to lead to billion dollar, a billion dollar company. And that gets investors excited. It's a $10 million market and a $10 million company if everything goes well. Um, I can't invest money into you at a $10 million valuation and because it's not going to be any worth more, worth more than $10 million, even when the thing works. So this is sort of pulling all that stuff together in terms of the market and the opportunity so that we can figure out how big this can be. Um, you can get this wrong, but it will hurt you in terms of, does it look like you know what you're doing? Like, I'm going to do all this math anyways. Um, and I'll give you my answer of this, but the better version is for you to have done the math and come in and say, here's what it looks like. And then for us to just believe that, and then you come across as way more credible as knowing where, knowing what we're interested in, in terms of market size, how the business model is going to get there. The, you're trying to build a credible story of here's this huge opportunity and here's a credible path to building a billion dollar company out of what we're talking about. Um, hopefully that answered your question. That was. Um, let's go on to. Thank you. Uh, you're welcome. Um, the first slides are like the first half of this. That's where all of the important stuff is. This is one story that should be telling. You should be telling the same story all the way through. So when you talk about the customer at the beginning, it's the customer that you're solving that has the pain that you're solving the problem for that. Uh, you're going to be able to charge them in this manner. And so like all of this should just be one, like one straight story all the way through. It shouldn't be this customer, I solved the problem. And then over here, I'm going to charge this other person. And, and when landing on the customer, you need to figure out who's, who has the pain and who's going to pay for solving that pain. And if those are the same people, you're in a good situation. If somebody like, and I'm going to uh, pick on the quantum dot greenhouse gas one, because uh, I think it's a really interesting technology. Um, so who is, I got my hand out. Um, but who is the who is the customer and who's who experiences the pain and who's going to pay for it are like the the questions for that one. Um, not that there isn't a really cool technology. Um, but so like that's the that's the stuff that will sort of go through our heads as you're going through these slides. And then the next five slides basically going through here are like what that looks like uh, over the yeah over the next few years as you run your business. Um, so now we know who the customer is. We know what problem it solves. We know there's an interesting opportunity here. Now tell me how you're going to execute on it. Tell me how you're going to deliver on the promise that your opportunity offers. Uh, so this is where it gets a bit uh, more challenging, but I, I want to see that um, here's your customer. How are you going to sell them your product? How are you going to reach them? Um, do we have a new volunteer to tell us who their customers and how they sell product to them? Uh, if not, we can go back to, I guess, I guess I could give you the GIT answer here, as I said I would. Um, so GIT sells paint. And um, there's a few options that they go about this. Um, and I'll give you the ones that we looked at and what we like about and what we don't like. Um, you could go the licensing route and license your technology to some other paint provider who already has the customers. Um, the problem with that is your customer, like you want to have access to your customers. You want to be able to talk to them. You want to be able to understand their pain and you want to be able to sell them directly. If somebody else is selling your customers, you probably don't 
understand your customers as well as you should. You don't have control of them switching to other opportunities. You don't know what the incentives are for your third party, uh, your part, your channel partner. You don't know what incentives there are for them to actually sell your product. Um, there's a lot of problems with that. And then ultimately they're taking a cut and often a bigger cut than probably is warranted and you're leaving money on the table. So if you can, you should be in touch with your customers and you should be uh, selling them directly instead of going through a, a third party. That's always preferable. Um, but so like in the case of GIT, especially in the beginning, eventually the, the final answer can be different than the early answer, but it's how are you getting into that market? And if you don't have some contact with your customer, we just aren't gonna believe it as much because you don't, you aren't talking to the customer. Um, and somebody else is selling them, they're not even your customer. There's just a much, much more risk around that. Um, so if you can make your own product, like GIT has some capacity to build, to produce their own paint and sell directly to the people who are going to be painting their ships. And um, especially in the early days, that's really important for understanding your customer and the value that you're offering, um, figuring that stuff out before you get to the channel partner and the licensing sort of plays. Uh, I'm going to, so Drew's got his hand up, but I'm going to see if there's another one that we haven't talked to yet who wants to tell us about their company and their customers. I'll give them 10 more seconds. Um, and I might, uh, can I pick on people, Shelly? Yes, you can. Okay. Oh, oh I don't even have to. There's Mark. Um, you're up, Mark. Hi, Andrew. Thanks I was for just talking about to pick you. on you, so uh, good job chiming in. <laughs> yeah, thanks. It's been really great. <clears throat> uh, I've learned a lot so far, and I feel like uh, it's a great opportunity to try to sharpen the axe here. So um, I'm Mark from Biota. We make graphene additives for the concrete industry. Um, a small dose of our biographing product allows customers to reduce Portland cement in their concrete products while maintaining or exceeding performance specs. Uh, the value to the customer is Portland cement is expensive, so reducing it saves money. Um, it's also the world's most carbon intensive material, so reducing it saves the planet. Um, you know, graphene is well known to densify concrete and improve strength, but ours is different because we make it from sawmill waste and not from graphite from, graphite from a mine. Um, you know, who uses it? Well, concrete is the world's most consumed material and our biographing product can be used in any concrete product. Um, we sell it directly to concrete producers as a bulk liquid product, like common, common concrete chemicals, which makes industry adoption easy. Okay. <laughs> that was me so, trying to like- <laughs> This, is, this is good, to summarize, here's the, so we've got up to this slide um, mm -hmm. and you're presumably selling them, like I won't say this is a, like you're selling a material and you're gonna sell them at a cost and they're gonna save money by buying your product. So how are you going to how are you going to find customers? Mark is the question. Then, um, yeah. Like how are you finding how are you finding concrete uh, producers, and how are you reaching out to them? How are they finding out about your product, yeah. and how are they going to how are they going through that buying journey? So the most important thing with concrete is uh, is for them to be able to trial it, and so we. Um, we try to get as many customers as possible samples so that they can test it and, and see how it works for themselves. And, um, you know, uh, once they're interested, it's just a matter of, you know, slotting in a tank next to the other tanks they have at site and starting to deliver it to them uh, in bulk format. Um, so, but how do we find those customers? I mean, you know, for us, uh, it's, it's having uh, channel partners right? People that already have customers that can, you know, introduce us to them and, and get some sort of like introduction fee, if you will. Um, but it's really important that we have that direct communication that you mentioned earlier, you know, the last thing you want to do is, you know, just hand off your product and have somebody else try to promote it and optimize it with a customer. You know, it's really important for us to have that uh, direct to customer concrete producer relationship um, so that we can help them to, to get the most of it. Um, great. Uh insight there um, as you're saying about this raises questions in my mind uh, and I, there's always questions so that, that's not a bad thing or a yeah. good thing it's just questions uh, so the questions that it raises is so this sounds like a 
fairly intensive relationship that you can't like somebody's not just coming to your website and clicking oh i want to buy uh alter biota's product and so that's not they need like some hand holding they need a person who comes to their site and like demos the product shows them how it works this sort of thing and um, that sort of model like it's called the direct sales model um so where you have salespeople and each individual salesperson it takes a fair bit of effort for them to work with the customer and get that sale so now here's where the questions come in is you need to look at the cost of acquiring that customer so how much is it, how much does it cost for you to have a salesperson go visit your customers and sell them the product mm -hmm. versus how much does that product generate you in revenue mm -hmm. for instance if your product if you're making 10 bucks a month off of this product there's no point in sending a salesperson to their site that's going to cost you ten thousand dollars of plane tickets and uh, hotels and that stuff to go sell them on the product when you're never going to make that money back so you have to be careful you have to think how much revenue can you get for your yeah. customers how much is that revenue worth and, and then that sort of is going to send you down the path of what sales models are available to you mm -hmm. so if you've got a hundred, like let's say you have a hundred thousand dollar contract with a company, uh, let's say your typical concrete producer buys a hundred thousand dollars worth of your product, this can probably work. You could probably have one salesperson who does maybe ten of these sales a year. It takes a month of their time to do each sale, and then that can all work together. Um, but like the the real thing that you're looking at here is you need to do this in a cost effective way so you need to understand how much it's going to cost to acquire one customer using the sales process that you're that you've settled on that you need to deliver and then how much value does that customer uh, give back to you uh, yeah. so what we would do in the software space is we would call this it's the lifetime value to customer acquisition cost mm -hmm. so if it costs you ten thousand dollars to acquire a customer that customer better be worth at least three times that amount and probably five times that amount. So if you mm -hmm. make, uh, it costs you $10,000 to acquire a customer, that customer better be worth $50,000 to you over the, over their lifetime or 30 at least. Um, mm -hmm. And that just, that just completely defines the available ways that you can sell your product. Mm -hmm. Now, there's a huge caveat to that. That's in the long run. You're for, you can do things in the beginning that don't yeah. make sense. So yeah. maybe maybe you're selling your product for ten dollars a month, Mark. Like Airbnb, like in the beginning they went around to every one of their like all like they would fly out to their hosts and check them out to make sure that they were good. That doesn't work in the long run. But in the beginning, you need to understand your customers well enough yep. that in the long run this might not. Here's what the long run looks like, and in the short term, here's how we're going to do it, and here's how that evolves over time. Um, yeah, but, yeah, absolutely. And, and some of the advantages, I think, of the of our market that we're working in the concrete industry is it's highly consolidated. And you know, if there's an adoption by a large ready mix company at the sort of you know their R and D level or their their upper level, it should there's there's a chance that it can be you know disseminated through their network pretty quickly. You know, rather than having to go to all 100 ready mix plants in their portfolio or something and sell it to them individually. So there's some like scale benefit. Right there, I suppose. And so like this is another play of who is your customer. Yeah, concrete producers, but are you targeting, let's say, concrete, what size of concrete producers? Yeah. Like how much like that same model might work if the concrete producer is at large volume, but might not work for a small volume. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so when you're talking about your customers, it's not just concrete producers, it's let's say concrete producers of this that that make this much concrete per year. Yeah because mm -hmm. now my business model i'm going to sell it to them for this amount and it's going to cost me this much to sell it to them and it only works if they're of this size or bigger mm -hmm. um, and so like pulling all of those pieces together um, like that's going to be the credible story of this all the whole story ties together in this slide i mean some of that's the bits that we're going to dig into after the fact but here it's the knowing your customer and the better you know your customer and how much they're worth and how much you can charge them and how much value you provide to them is basically the whole story that drives the business model. Uh, Drew, did you have a follow-on question or is that from before? Yeah, I do. Um, 
so uh, quite a few of the companies have spoken have a product. Um, but for those of us that are still in development, um, for instance, uh, we're looking at three and a half months to getting to TRL level seven. And um, so we're looking at, you know, maybe getting a pilot project with a, a company to get a, a early adopter. Uh, innovative solutions is a, is a, a testing stream is a, of interest to us, but it could be another company, a major shipping company, et cetera. Do you have any advice about uh, basically running a, a an order book, a pre-order book, or something like people order for an aircraft. They order it in advance and they expect production to happen, the deliveries to happen in due course. Is there is there any parallel for the ocean tech so community? The, the first answer is you need to talk to customers, which is good. So the more customers you talk to, the better. Um, but you're going to want to prioritize those customers in terms of like, are they early adopters of technology versus are they late adopters? Are they is your product ready to buy? Are they going to be comfortable working with something that kind of half works and working with you to make it work? Or do they want to just sort of buy something straight off the shelf that, that works? Um, the ideal, obviously, is to work with those early adopters up front and find customers who, uh, in your case, probably have already who've experienced the pain. Like if they haven't experienced the pain that your potential product is going to solve, uh, they're probably not going to be an early adopter. So let's say somebody's lost a ship and they don't want to lose another one. They're likely going to want to work with you and they're going to give you insight into your product and how, how to build it um, and insight into that value. Like what you're trying to get out of those early customers is one validation that there is actually a pain that they would actually pay for. Um, so that when you build the product, hey, I've got this pro product I'm going to build, um, knowing the pain and that the customers have and that they will buy it. Uh, if you can build it at a certain price, like if, the, if they have a $100,000 pain um, and your product costs $100,000, it's probably not worth like going down that path. But if your product is a million dollar pain and it costs $100,000, um, now you have some constraints around the business that you're building from the early stages. You don't need to have those all Full, you don't need to have all those customers and all that stuff proven out, but the more that you've talked to customers, the more that you validated that pain, the more confidence you can have when you're spending money to build a product that solves that pain. The more customers who have that pain, uh, the better. Um, just make sure that you set expectations around the, how good the product is going to be on that first iteration uh, with those customers and how long it's going to take before they see that. As long as you're confident in terms of setting your expectations with your customers, more customers is better, um, but don't bite off more than you can chew. So it's, a, it's that sort of balance of what can you reasonably deliver? If you're gonna say, I can't deliver this to you in five until five years from now, you probably don't wanna to talk to them um, until you're sort of ready and taking on too big of a customer too early can be a problem as well. And they're generally slower anyway. So you don't wanna go with Irving, maybe you're going with a small, uh, like the, the smaller ship producer or something like that. Um, I'm going to go to Sean. You have a question, Sean? I do. Uh, you don't like licensing. You do like direct sales models. I assume there must be a short list of models that you do and don't like, and I'd love to know what they are. Um, in terms of, I'll go through some of the business models. So direct, like direct sales, doesn't have like direct sales getting on the phone and like having owning your customer is important. Somebody else owning your customer is less valuable because you have less control. Uh, in terms of models, and I'll go into specific business models, um, ones where your customer is engaged with you are better than ones where your customer isn't engaged with you. So like, let's say you've got regular contact with those customers versus they, they buy something once every five years. Um, and I'm thinking of, like GIT is a bit different. If, if I'm just selling one ship owner and every five years they come back, like you want contact with your customers so that you're, so that you can interact with them, you can sell them all the time. So like rather than a single ship owner, if you own a fleet of companies and every month you're doing a new ship, that's much better than the same dollar value where you've got a hundred individual companies. Um, in terms of direct sales versus um, organic growth or versus like, um, like 
there's not necessarily one that's better than the other in terms of the sales approach. It really is the one that fits the size of your, your customer. And so it's just like deciding on what that customer looks like. Um, having said that, large customers, they take longer to come on. They have long sales cycles. So it takes, let's say it takes a year to bring on a million dollar customer instead of a week to bring on a thousand dollar customer. Um, so once you get those customers, however, though, they tend to stay longer. So if it takes a year to come on, they're going to be with you for five years, almost guaranteed. If it takes a week for them to come on, they might be gone in six months. And um, so there's a bit of a trade-off, um, but lower churn of your customers is always better than higher churn. And that usually means higher value customers, but those ones are harder to pull off. So it's a bit of a balance again of what can you do and when. The more big customers you have, the better. Relying on a single customer is bad. And uh, let's say you only have one customer, it's $100 million in revenue, that's great. And then what happens when they change their mind, the whole business is sunk versus having a like a, a thousand million dollar customers is better than $1 billion customer. Uh, just because it provides more predictability and less risk. Uh, so it's all really about risk and predictability uh, and matching your customer to your product and the value that you provide. Um, Fidel, I'm uh, sorry on the pronunciation. No, you pronounced it correctly. Uh, great session, Andrew. Thanks for all the informative information. So my question is about when you have your customers are two segments, one who would buy the product and one would be the users. Yeah. So the users are interested in your product, but then how to convince those who are like at the management level to so, purchase uh, the product and to make it more clear, let's say the ship crew would be the users, but then the managing companies at shore would be the one purchasing the product. And there, is, there isn't the same understanding of the importance of the product because there's always a disconnect between the people working ashore at management and the people working at sea and what their needs are. Thanks. Um, yeah, and so this is not unusual. Um, let's say the closer connect, and I said the user versus the person who gets the value, the further apart they are, the less good it is. Um, but it's very common for there to be uh, multiple touch points, let's say in a sale. So like, let's say you're selling to a company X, and the people who use it at company X are the ship's crew, but the person making the decision is the, the manager on shore. And so you've got to find that right path through the people in that company so that, for instance, who are you reaching out to and who is going to be the one who, like, the person you're reaching out to is not probably the final decision maker. It's probably, you got to find your champion in that company. And maybe it's the ship's, like it's the demographic. It's like the the manager who's been a ship's crew uh, person in the past. So you're sort of laying out your ideal customer profile. And it's like, this is the person that I want to talk to. If they have this experience, these are the people I want to talk to first because they will get the pain. Um, or it's like, you, you've got to find your champion and then all the people along that, that sort of sales path to like, they're going to, who are they going to need to bring in? And so this is just going to just provide more information in your sales process as you're working this through. It's like, okay, here's the person I reach out to. It's the ship's captain. Um, he experiences the pain. Okay, I found the ship's captain. Once I found the ship's captain, he's gonna have to go talk to this person at his company who's gonna make the decision. So I'm reaching out to the ship's captain. Once that ship captain brings in the operations manager who, or whoever it is, that's so that, that sort of moves them down that sales process. And you know that you're not gonna be able to make the sale to the ship's captain. So there's a different playbook to re go from the ship's captain to the decision maker. Uh, and it's finding that right path through the right people between connecting the person who makes, who experiences the pain and the one who makes the decision. Um, and that's, that's very common, it's, especially as you get into bigger customers. The bigger the customer, the more layers of sort of decision making in a process. The bigger the sale, the more people involved. If it's a small sale, one individual he has the pain, uh, buys the product. It's a very straightforward, but um, yeah, the bigger it is, the more people are involved and you've got to find that path through it. Um, 
And there's, yeah, so it's finding the path and telling us that, like the more you tell us the, about that, I say the more, the better, but like we, these people have the pain. So in our sales process, we talk to them and then they bring in this person. And when that person gets brought in, it closes at this rate or like those sorts of things is basically your sales funnel and talking us through that. But there's no definitive answer up front, I guess. Um, we've got 10 minutes. This is not behind schedule, believe it or not. Um, I'm going to move on to slide seven. Um, because this here's another important one. So competitive landscape. Um, what we want to see is how you position yourself uh, against your competition. And yes, you do have competitors. Uh, generally, what I like to see here is my two by two matrix. Uh, with let's say I'm looking at my screen, um, you up in the right, and I think this is probably mirrored. So maybe you up in the right, and then everybody else everywhere else. Uh, what's really important to me here is how are you different from your competitors and why are you going to win? Um, so let's say you're cheaper and faster than your competitors. Um, and so we're, you have the X axis is maybe cheap and the Y axis is fast. And so the faster you are and the cheaper you are, if you're cheap and fast, you win. If you're cheap and slow, you're down here. Um, the key is understanding what, what those axes are and how you differentiate from your from your customer. So it's not gonna be cheap and fast for everybody. What makes you different from the competition? I generally don't like to see the list of, here's the 15 attributes of our product. Here's the 15 of our competitors and we have different ones than, uh, than everybody else does and we have them all, therefore we win. Uh, customers aren't gonna make decisions off of the 15 attributes. There's probably two or three at best that matter to them and understanding what matters to your customer and what features of your product versus your competition uh, your product offers over the competition like know your customer that know that they value fast and cheap or whatever your two axes are um, but it's how how you basically differentiate from everybody else who's trying to do the same thing if you don't have a direct competitor tell me how people are doing this today um, so uh, I'm thinking of the Sean and the quantum dot. So you might not have a competitor who has full spectrum cameras, but there maybe there's other types of sensors that do this. So you're you might be cheaper, or you might be you might have location information instead of just saying, "Hey, I detected uh, a greenhouse gas." I have location information, so I can precisely say where a leak is coming from. Rather than there is a leak, we tell people where the leak is happening. Um, so. Maybe yours is location information, and that's the, that's the key driving difference between you versus your competition. Um, but it, it's fine, that, like showing us that you know that how people are solving this problem without you, uh, and how you're different from the other solutions that are out there. Whether they're whether you whether they're direct competitors or indirect competitors. Um, I, I'm not going to take a lot of questions on that. I'm going to run through the next few slides, and then I'll maybe take. Uh, questions after I get through these next ones. Um, management team right here. First off, I expect everybody here on this call is fairly early stage, hasn't received like tens of millions of dollars of investment. Um, if you have, you probably don't need to hear this again from me. Um, but the idea here is your early stage you're going to have gaps in your company. That's actually expected. If you don't have gaps in your company, you're probably spending too much money at an early stage. You, you don't have a fully formed team. Um, what we want to see here is who are the key players on your team and advisors, board of directors. This is good. Um, what I want to see is why is this team going to win? Uh, so you've laid out the opportunity in sort of the first half. You've given me the case for a product like yours You've told me why your product is, how your product is differentiated versus your competition. Now I wanna see is show me a reason why you win over the competition, why this team that you've assembled is better than the, than the other team that's trying to do the same thing. Um, and especially what I'm looking for here is show me that you get stuff done. Like that's a key factor for startups is not just having a great story, but delivering on, on promises that you made. Um, so for me, the best way for us to do that as an organization when we're looking at investments is I know you over time. So for instance, if I've met you before, let's say I met you a year ago, I talked with you, I see where you were. 
the next time I meet you, it's like, wow, they've made a lot of progress in that time. They said they were going to do this and they did this and some, like those are the companies that are, that win is the ones that do, like anybody can lay out a great plan. It's the ones that actually execute on that plan, actually deliver on it. So if you're making progress, your investors are going to be impressed. And if you're doing what you said you would do, I'll give you much more, uh, a higher likelihood of doing what you're telling me you're going to do in the future. Um, so showing me that you get stuff done and showing me why you're the why you're the ideal team to deliver on this specific product that you're building. Um, yeah, and understanding that there will be gaps on your team. You don't need to have all those spots filled uh, because that costs money and you probably are spending too much money if you filled all the gaps. Uh, financial projections and key metrics. So another generalization. What I'm going to want to see is the typical hockey stick. So uh, I'm going to try to do it. Assuming I'm my, so is it like up and to the right? Um, what I want to see here is a, not that I believe that this is going to be what the projections turn out to be, but I want to know what this opportunity looks like if things go well. So when you tell me, hey, I got this great opportunity, huge, it's going to be huge. And five years from now, we're going to have a million dollars in revenue. That might be a great business, but for me, huge, huge is a vague term. For me, it's different than it is for you. And for me, what I want to see is in five to 10 years, getting to a hundred million dollars in revenue and a path to get there, a credible path to get there. Uh, or maybe you get to $50 million in revenue and that's still pretty interesting. Um, but what I'm really looking for more than the path to get there is what does the end game look like? in terms of the size of the opportunity from your mind. If you think this is gonna be a $10 million in revenue business, um, I'm not gonna think, oh, I think they're wrong. This is gonna be a $100 million business. I'm not gonna give you the benefit of the doubt on the upside, but if your big vision is only a $10 million business, then I'm basically gonna disqualify you in my mind thinking, or I might try to push you to think bigger. Um, but if you don't think it can be bigger than $10 million business, I'm not, you're not going to be able to convince me that this can be a hundred million dollar business or a billion dollar business. And so when you generate your projections, give me five years and show me how big this gets in five years. Um, and I want to see it like, I'm just looking for how big you think this can get. Um, and so that's why every one of these should look similar. It's like, oh, here's our business getting in year eight, getting to a hundred million dollars in revenue uh, or whatever it is. Um, and then you've got what's key is not the projection itself, but the story and the path to deliver on those projections. So you said you're going to do this. Now show me that you're doing this along the way and give me a clear path to be able, how you're going to be able to do this. The slide is all about the path needs to be big enough. And then the story needs to be credible of how you're actually going to get there. Um, oh yeah. So yeah, this, do a bottom-up forecast, not top-down. So don't tell me just that you're going to capture 10% of the market. I'm going to do that in my head, and it's pretty easy to do. A billion-dollar market, can you capture 100% of that? No, 150% of that, definitely not. 3% of that, probably. Uh, but don't just say, hey, we're going to capture 3% of the market, and it's going to be a $300 million business. Show me how many customers you are going to acquire. Like, here's how many customers we're going to acquire. Here's how much they are going to pay us each year. Here's how much we're going to acquire year over year over year. And then when they pay us, this is going to roll up into this amount. Instead of the uh, top down, we're going to capture 3% of the market. We're going to capture 1,000 customers, and they're going to pay us this amount. Um, and yeah. Um, then let's say current status, where you're at. Tell us, tell us where you're at today. Um, and what the, let's say the near future looks like and how you're gonna use the money you're, you're trying to raise. So let's say you're asking me for a million dollars in investment. Um, what I need to know where you're at today in terms of your business. Uh, but what I'm really interested in is what is your business gonna look like basically a, a year from now? And the idea is that I'm gonna give you a million dollars of investment. That million dollars probably is gonna last you 18 months, uh, maybe two years. And what I want to see is that with that money, you're going to be able to make enough progress with your, with your business to be able to raise the next round of investment. So let's say right now you're raising a million dollars. With a million dollars, can you get your business far enough along to be able to raise $3 million in your next round? 
And what do you need to be able to do to raise $3 million? And so let's say today you're raising a million dollars and you have some initial sales with customers. And I'm going to use a, a software business that is, let's say, purely revenue that isn't, you're not building a new hardware, you're not building a new product, but you've got some initial customers today and you can raise a million dollars. With that million dollars, I want to see you maybe get to a million dollars in revenue where you can raise $3 million. So show me the path of going from $250,000 in revenue in year one to let's say $750,000 a year from now, and then you'll be able to raise money. Um, the best way to know what you need to do to be able to raise that next round is to talk to the investors who are likely to give you that money at the next round. So if we give you a million dollars, we're also likely to be involved in the next round where we might give you $2 million as part of a four or $5 million round. We know what we, we're gonna wanna see 12 months from now. So you ask us for a million, here's what you need to do to be able to get to, to be able to raise 4 million, half of it from us. Um, and so like, that's the whole story. And then it's, yeah, it's basically, can you get there in the time that you have allotted with the money that you have? Um, that's the last slide in the deck. And I'll, I've, got, I've got, I think a bit of time for questions. Um, and I see Drew's hand up again, and I'll take that one from him, and then the last, a few last questions. But go ahead, Drew. Yeah, just a quick one. Uh, when you're talking about a million dollars, there was that uh, kind of uh, metaphoric? Are you, you mean Nova Corp or Ecoa specifically? Um, I mean, let's say if a Nova Corp were to invest in a million dollars, and we often make investments of a million dollars. That's around our sweet spot. Um, so we make a million dollar investment in a company, and yes, we do that. Um, we make a bunch of those investments every year. Um, what I want to see is with that million dollars of our, of our investment, maybe you go get another million dollars from a co and another million dollars from another investor. Now you've got $3 million and now it's going to, uh, companies are pretty good at forecasting their expenses. So you're going to spend that $3 million or $2 million or $1 million. What do I get for that money? And by me, what do I get is like, how, what does the company look like? You invest a million dollars into the company. What does the company look like after you spent that million dollars? And the value of the company hopefully has increased over that time so that you can raise two or $3 million from your next investors at a reasonable valuation. And then they can give you two or $3 million. Um, I'm gonna go to next questions. Uh, Mark, it looks like you might've been the next one. Um, yeah, I had a, just a, I wanted to see if I could get a little bit more information from you uh, regarding your comments uh, earlier, um, because it's uh, your comments have been similar to ones we've received before. So uh, we are, although we make small aircraft, we're very, very much like uh, a, a regular aircraft company you would think of like Boeing, in that when you buy an aircraft for Boeing, you might be delivering packages for UPS, or you simply might be carrying passengers. Uh, same plane. However, it's sort of decked out differently inside, but in essence, it's the same plane certification is the same. And so your comment, which we hear a lot is, you know, pick that vertical. Are you delivering things? Are you delivering a part? Or are you doing search and rescue? And it's very interesting because from us, it's the same aircraft, although we may make some custom modifications, but those are very inexpensive and very quick for us to make. We're actually selling the aircraft that goes a certain distance at a certain speed, has specifications that meet the needs of everybody, just like if I was shipping cargo or people to Hong Kong. So my question is quite simply, uh, how do we, uh, Again, so, without uh, trying to go to multiple things, we're not trying to introduce multiple businesses, but we're sort and, of that level up, right? Sorry, that's, here, that's, that's, that's it. And we, and we see this often. And here's, a, here's exactly what you're looking at this from the perspective of the person who builds the aircraft rather than the business model. So having been on that side of, uh, of the table, you're building one product and it's the same product and you could sell it to this person, this person, this person, and this person. And so, hey, let's just build it and then we'll sell it to everyone. We're like, that's, that's the, as builders, that's exactly the way we think. 
Think of it from the invest for each one of those. Think of those as independent businesses, though, that have different value propositions, different when there's a different value proposition, each customer is going to get a different value out of this. So each customer, one customer can pay more for this product than another because he's getting more value out of it. If he can pay more, that enables sort of different sales channels that you can like this customer. This customer is only ever going to buy it off the internet directly from me because the value isn't high enough for me to send a salesperson to go. I'll spend twenty thousand dollars sending a salesperson to go sell in this hundred thousand dollar system because he's only going to get ten thousand dollars out of value. So there's a different sales channel. There's a different value proposition. It's a whole different business model, and you've got to. So if you're if you've got all of these, you have to prove all of those out for all of them. Versus if you've got one of those. Let's say you're selling to the search and rescue market and then this business is big enough. Now I can focus all of my efforts on not just the product, but the whole business model, the path to market, the value proposition, all the stuff that I just told you in the story, you're telling one story to one customer. And if that's big enough, that's perfect. And then the ideal scenario is that there's a whole bunch of these other ones that, hey, once we nail this one, um, all of these other ones are going to come too. But we're going after this one because they provide the we give them the they have the highest value prop for it. Basically, that's what you're looking for is who gets the most value out of this in terms of one customer plus the whole size of the, the whole customer segment. Um, and so you go down that value chain and you basically are selling it to the customer who gets the most value out of it because that is the that's the sort of the best path. Um, but think of it as you have one product, but you're you basically have like have to build five businesses to go sell that product. The challenge is I would bet highly that you're going to be able to build the product. The risk is almost always that can you get the customers to buy it? And that's the risk that we want to see validated by you selling to customers. And if you've got five different customers, it's much harder to validate five different customers than it is to validate one customer, a customer segment. So yeah, you can build the product, but I want to see if you can build the business. And that comes by validating the customer and growing that customer base. And that's the stuff that gets investors interested because I would bet in this room uh, of the businesses, uh, businesses are going to fail because they can't get customers, not because like every one of you, I bet is going to be able to build your product. I would bet on that in terms of investment. Um, I would also bet that the reason most of you are going to fail is because you don't get customers, not because you don't build the product. Um, Perfect. That's super helpful. I um, really I'm going to go to Fidal and then Pratish, and then I think that's probably the end of questions. So you missed out if you're not one of those two. So Fidal. Perfect. Thanks, Andrew. Um, so you touched based on the importance of a prototype uh, of a product. So my question is, if you are at an early stage of developing your solution and need funding to build it, would creating visuals of how the product would look like and its functions would be good enough to pitch for funding or do you need to build at least a basic functioning product in this case let's say a software in order to convince investors in your solution so and this is going to depend on the sector you're in and how much money it takes to build your product um, but usually like where investor like you're going to probably have to struggle in the early days to pull together the resources, maybe the IRAP, uh, a co of money to develop your product. Um, we're going to see we're we're going to want to see a product that's pretty close to prototype ready. Um, if it's in the ocean space, if it's in the software space, you need to have something built. But we we generally don't fund projects. Most institutional investors won't fund projects to develop the technology and build the technology. It's more once you're pretty close to being ready for market. Now, this might not be the answer you want to hear, but if you don't have a product built, maybe you have product, if you if you develop the technology or the technology has been developed at the university, ideally we want to see somebody else have already paid for that, frankly. Um, so like if, a, if you've got university research grants, the IRAP has paid for it. Um, it's got to be super compelling uh, to fund development of the product. They're, like the TRL readiness levels is probably the key metric if you're building something hard and physical rather than software where you are. And that's going to, that's going to influence how much money you can get from which sources. Um, I don't have offhand, I don't know where you're at, but um, it's probably a struggle to get, uh, if you don't have a prototype, you probably like, 
find find a way to make that happen as cheaply as you can because uh, i'm probably not interested in it with just a just an idea is not going to get investment to build it. you're going to have to make some progress of proving out the technology in some way um so that's probably the the short answer uh pratish Hi Andrew, thank you for thank you for the great talk. My question is about uh, when investors are looking for returns. Is it sufficient to show that the market is big enough and this is how big the company can get, or do we need to spell out how investors would make their returns? You don't need to spell it out for me. Um, so I'm gonna like that's I'm a professional in that space. I figure that out. What I want to see is your big vision for your company. Uh, the short answer. I'll give you what our expectations for return. Like we want to see probably a 20 or 30 or 40 X. So I put a million bucks in, I would love to get 30 million back. Like um, that can come in over, over rounds, but the idea is you need to have very big potential. So if you can get to hundred million in revenue, you can be a billion dollar business. I can invest in you and I'm going to make it like the return is going to be there. Um, the reason I need such large returns Let's, is because most, uh, this is the part you might not want to hear, most startups fail. Um, so let's say we invest a uh, million dollars in 10 companies. How many of those companies pay off? Maybe two or three. Uh, so for us to be good at our jobs, we want those investments to pay off enough to one. If we invest in 10 and eight fail, uh, we got to at least make 5X to just break even. Um, 10x is probably covering our cost of capital, 20x and we're good at our job. Um, and so if your company doesn't have the potential to give us a 10x return on our investment, like let's say if everything goes well, everything works out exactly as planned and we get 10 times our money back, yeah, that's probably the minimum. That's probably the, the minimum bar. If, we get, if everything goes according to plan and we have this big success, but the big success is only five times our money, we probably lost money as investors. But it's not your job to prove out, the, to show us the return. It's your job to share your vision of what your company can become uh, and tell us how big your company, like what is your vision? How big is your company going to be? And the basic idea is if it's big, uh, the returns aren't going to matter. Uh, but we need it to be big enough so that when it, when it wins, it pays off for all of the ones that failed as well. Um, and now here's, the, here's how this all works. Um, starting a company, uh, starting a startup generally is irrational. You're making a bet on yourself and you have to believe that you're the exception. Um, now, I'm hoping that every one of you in this room believes you're the exception. Uh, because if you don't believe you're the exception to the rule, you shouldn't be here probably. Uh, if you don't think you can, if you can pull this off where no one else can or no one else has or no one else will, uh, like those are the ones like, if you don't believe in you, you're not gonna convince anybody else to believe in you. Uh, we're looking for the exceptions to the rule. Uh, a lot of you are gonna fail. Um, that doesn't matter. That doesn't mean you shouldn't try. Um, and we'll invest in you if we believe you can do it. And that starts with you believing that you can do it yourselves. Um, and there's probably a very good reason why you believe that and why you're here uh, and why this all works. Um, just because it's not a rational financial decision uh, doesn't mean you shouldn't do it because if you don't, nobody will. And if you're in this business, it's because you're doing something to change the world and make it a better place uh, and do something great. And if you don't try, nobody tries, nothing ever happens. And um, so we need you to be doing this, not from an investment perspective, but from the world needs people to be taking risks and doing things that aren't necessarily rational for themselves because they believe in themselves and they're betting on themselves. Um, and if you believe it, you're gonna get people to bet in you, on you too. If you don't believe it, nobody will invest in you. Um, and that's all I have for you. I think we went over by a few minutes, uh, 10 minutes, that's not too bad considering there's maybe 40 people in the room. Uh, thank you all for coming out and hopefully this helps and uh, feel free to use this template. Uh, that will simplify it when you come in and pitch to us and others out there. And I wish you all the best of luck. Thanks again. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks. Perfect. Thank you very much, Andrew. Um, great tidbits of information. I always learn something new every time I hear you uh, present this workshop. Um, I'm going to say the last word for Jennifer.
um, which we'll talk about next week. And thanks again, Andrew. My pleasure. I'm just seeing all the comments in the chat. I'm getting through them. Thanks, Shelley. Um, so there's one other thing we'd just like to mention before we end the session today, which is um, that we are offering to attendees an exciting opportunity to win free coaching sessions with Sarah Colburn, who's a local uh, well-known strategic communications expert. This coaching will focus on developing your story, marketing yourself and your company, and refining your pitch. Uh, so you'll have the opportunity to apply for this free coaching at the end of the series. So after the final session next week, we'll send out an email with instructions on how to apply. Criteria we will assess will include things like your current or prospective Nova Scotia footprint, stage of your company, market potential, technology readiness, and so forth. So stay tuned. Uh, it's a great valuable opportunity. We'd love to see you apply to take part. And lastly, I'd like to just say thank you again to Andrew and to everyone uh, for attending. Again, this is the third session of our four-part investment readiness series. And in the final session next week, we will dive deeper into closing the deal. So everything from finding a lead investor to negotiating key terms and governance. And I will mention that John Sari is not only an uh, investment director on our team, but also has significant experience raising himself. So it's sure to be a very informative and interesting session. So if you haven't RSVP'd already and would like to attend, please send me an email. And if you have already RSVP'd, we will see you next week. Thanks, everyone.